This is one of the most technologically advanced operating rooms in the world, yet its patients are not human. This room is part of the cardiovascular research laboratories at the Texas Heart Institute in Houston. Before new tools and techniques in the fight against the myriad afflictions of the heart and circulatory system can be used in humans, they must first be investigated in humane fashion in a small number of animal subjects. On this particular morning, Dr. Robert Jarvik has flown in from New York to test a new apparatus that is designed to assist a failing heart chamber. Jarvik is perhaps best known for his role in the development of the total artificial heart that bore his name. It was in December of 1982 that the world's attention was focused on Salt Lake City, Utah, where the Jarvik 7 total artificial heart had been implanted in the chest of a 61-year-old dentist named Barney Clark. This operation became one of the most publicly conducted clinical research projects of its time. A carefully worded media campaign would lead many to believe that this was the first time in history that a human had received a mechanical heart. In reality, however, there were two other men whose lives were successfully sustained by total artificial hearts before Barney Clark received his. Their stories are just part of a rich and vivid history of the Texas Heart Institute's experience with mechanical hearts, a history that spans over a quarter of a century and continues today. Herein lies the account of the earliest artificial heart implants and their aftermath as mechanical heart research comes to fruition at the dawning of a new millennium. Heart transplantation is today the most effective means of treatment for irreversible end-stage cardiac failure. It allows for a patient's dying heart to be removed and replaced by a healthy heart from a human donor who has experienced what medical professionals describe as brain death. This surgical procedure, aided by modern anti-rejection drugs, has saved the lives of thousands worldwide. While it is estimated that some 35,000 Americans could benefit each year from heart transplantation, there is an annual average of only 2,000 available donor hearts. The donor shortage problem is nothing new to the field of heart transplantation. This dilemma plagued surgeons even before Christian Barnard performed the first successful human heart transplant operation in South Africa in December of 1967. In the minds of many medical scientists, only a mass-produced mechanical cardiac prosthesis could serve the vast numbers of patients with terminal heart disease. Such an opinion was held by a research team at the Cleveland Clinic in the 1950s. Under the direction of Dr. Willem Call, inventor of the artificial kidney, the Cleveland Clinic group conducted a series of synthetic heart implants in dogs. These researchers would not be alone in this field of medical science. Similar studies were soon underway at Baylor University College of Medicine in Houston, Texas, where investigators in 1962 reported their experiences with an apparatus designed to assist the left ventricle, the heart's most vital blood pumping chamber. The pump, used successfully in 47 canine subjects, was primarily the brainchild of Dr. Domingo Liotta, a native Argentinian who had previously worked with the Cleveland Clinic research team. Leota had come to Houston in 1961 in order to work alongside two contemporary masters of cardiovascular surgery. By the end of the 1950s, doctors Denton Cooley and Michael DeBakey had become heart surgery's preeminent leaders. Initially, Houston's Methodist Hospital served as the base for both men's surgical practices. But limited operating room space and patient beds soon became a problem as the professional practices of the two legendary surgeons expanded. 
Thus, in 1962, Denton Cooley moved his surgical services to St. Luke's Episcopal Hospital and the adjoining Texas Children's Hospital in Houston. From there, he went on to establish the Texas Heart Institute, a research and educational foundation on the St. Luke's premises. In spite of the change in hospital affiliations, Cooley remained on the faculty at Baylor College of Medicine. There, the mechanical heart research program was thriving, providing an early opportunity for Dr. DeBakey, the medical school's president, to implant the first total artificial heart in a human. But seven years after Domingo Leota's arrival at Baylor, laboratory resources and manpower continue to be devoted almost exclusively toward the evolution of the ventricular assist pump. The promise of building a workable total artificial heart was what had originally brought Leota to Houston, but by the autumn of 1968, little progress had been made. In quiet desperation, Leota began to seek a sympathetic ally. By this time, Denton Cooley had established himself as the world leader in heart transplantation. In May of 1968, he performed America's first successful heart transplant and soon led the world in the number of transplant operations performed. Dr. Cooley is the man with the golden hand, the only man with the golden hand. He gave my husband life. But organ donations were virtually unheard of in 1968, and Cooley faced a difficult dilemma. Well, uh, it was evident in those early days of uh, cardiac transplantation after Christian Barnard had done his initial one, and when we did ours in early uh, 1968, a uh, number of months after that, that we weren't going to have enough donors. Uh, we had uh, many, many recipients, patients with terminal heart disease, but we could not uh, supply the need. Thus, when Domingo Leota paid Cooley a visit in November of 1968, both men had a mutual objective in mind. He was uh, becoming rather frustrated in his uh, investigative uh, work. Uh, he uh, thought that the time had come uh, to make an attempt to save the life of someone who was actually dying in the operating room. And uh, we talked about it, and we talked about the device. We uh, talked about uh, uh, where we would get the funds to proceed with our experiment, uh, and uh, decided that perhaps we could bring this thing up to a clinical level uh, before uh, the anticipated target date, which might have been 10 or 15 years later. Though Denton Cooley was still a clinical professor at Baylor College of Medicine with unrestricted access to its research facilities, he nevertheless chose to finance this particular project with his own money. The two surgeons devised a system that would allow a four-chambered mechanical heart to be powered by an external console. They employed the services of biomedical engineer William O'Bannon to devise the hydraulic mechanisms of the system. Engineers John Manus and Hardy Borland joined O'Bannon in constructing the drive console that would power the heart. For a time, O'Bannon's own garage was used for the assembly of the console. Domingo Leota had spent 15 years preparing for this project. He and Cooley and the engineering team would take a mere four months to fabricate the heart and have it tested in six calves. The heart was composed primarily of biologically compatible silicone and fabric materials. Cooley provided four uniquely designed heart valves to make the device 40% more efficient than Leota's previous models at Baylor. Blood would be propelled by the heart's flexible internal diaphragms in response to the pulsatile rising and falling of carbon dioxide gas pressures from the external drive console. Though never intended as a permanent substitute for the human heart, the device was intended to keep a dying patient alive until a suitable donor heart could be obtained. Just as animal studies with the device were concluding, along came Haskell Carp. 
The 47-year-old Skokie, Illinois resident had checked into Houston St. Luke's Hospital on March 5, 1969, after his own doctors had given up the hope of saving him. Multiple heart attacks had caused much of the muscle tissue in Karp's ventricles to decompose and become fibrotic. He was really desperately ill. Uh, he had extensive coronary heart disease with extensive scarring uh, in the heart muscle of the myocardium. In fact, he had even had a pacemaker put in to drive this little tired heart. And we brought him to uh, Houston uh, when he wanted a transplant. And we kept him in the hospital here for four to six weeks waiting for a transplant. This man was desperately ill. He had even the slightest effort would bring on uh, chest pain or extreme shortness of breath. He couldn't even comb his or brush his own hair. He was so uh, tired. Uh, and, but after he was becoming desperate and, and discouraged, I discussed with him the possibility that uh, uh, we could repair this ventricle with what we'd call a ventriculoplasty. Uh, and uh, because I didn't see that we were going to get a heart for him, a donor heart. He agreed and I told him, and we discussed the possibility that if I could not get him off of our support device, uh, that we would use the total artificial heart. Told him it had never been used in a human patient before. He understood it well and he gave us total consent. Uh, even his rabbi was present at the time that he uh, gave his consent. Uh, and his wife and everyone knew that there was this possibility. He held out the hope that we could repair his heart uh, and bring him through without doing something as uh, uh, aggressive as putting in a total mechanical artificial heart. The surgery took place on Good Friday, April 4th, 1969. The repair procedure involved a technique Cooley had perfected. The plan was to remove dead tissue from the heart in a way that would allow adequate cardiac function to be maintained. But in Karp's case, the damage was extensive, affecting more than two-thirds of the ventricular walls. Though Cooley was concerned that there would not be enough healthy muscle tissue left to salvage the heart, he nevertheless proceeded with the operation. A heart-lung bypass machine was used to filter Karp's blood, oxygenate it, then deliver it through his circulatory system while his heart was being operated on. This apparatus kept the patient alive while the lungs were collapsed and the heart was stopped and drained of blood for the repair. As planned, Dr. Cooley began removing the large fibrous mass of dead muscle tissue from Karp's heart, avoiding major arterial branches. The healthier remnants of the ventricular tissue were then sutured together. But there was very little viable muscle tissue to work with. We proceeded with uh, the operation, but the old ventricle just wouldn't, wouldn't work afterward. And even after we'd done the repair, and it was evident that he was going to uh, expire in the operating room unless we attempted something to save his life. Dr. Camel Gerges was an anesthesiologist on the CARP case. I remember that this is another case where you fail to achieve favorable result. Uh, we done the operation of repairing the heart and the heart, the repaired heart, did not put out, in plain words. Uh, we couldn't get him off the heart-lung machine. Though the heart-lung bypass machine continued to circulate oxygenated blood, 
Haskell Carp was, in essence, as good as dead on the operating table. I had always said that was a very critical moment uh, for a surgeon to have a patient on the cardiopulmonary bypass and then after you find that you cannot restore his heartbeat, you just tell them to pull the plug out of the wall and stop the pump. And that to me is an enormous defeat. Uh, the biggest defeat that a surgeon, a heart surgeon, uh, can experience. They just finally have to give up, say that's it, even though the heart might be feebly contracting still, uh, you know that it's hopeless. But this time, Dr. Cooley had a contingency plan. A surgical research fellow, Dr. Bruno Mesmer, was dispatched to retrieve Leota's device. I can't figure out how much time we sat in that situation. Bruno Mesmer shows up, and Dr. Mesmer had two big Samsonite cases and he put them on a table on the side of the room and opened them. And inside there were gadgets that looked uh, very strange, but from my high stool that I always stand on, I kept looking at them and realized that they have chambers. The gadgets have chambers and had valves in them. And just dawned on me that I might be seeing something I have never seen before. Cooley made an incision in the right atrium and severed the electrode cable to Carp's pacemaker. The incision was extended into the left atrium. The two major outflow arteries of the heart, the aorta and pulmonary artery, were also separated from the organ. Haskell Karp's dead heart was then removed, leaving an open space in the chest cavity. Leota's artificial heart was then brought to the surgical field. Right and left sides of the device were separable so that implant and suturing could be simplified. Atrial cuffs of the artificial heart were sewn to Carp's atrial tissue remnants. Meanwhile, a surgical assistant made an incision at the base of the rib cage for the externalization of the drive lines. These lines were attached to the console. After outflow grafts were sutured to the aorta and pulmonary artery, word was given to activate the drive console. The artificial heart began pumping. Uh, this equipment that I see for the first time is implanted. It has drive hoses and cables coming out of it, goes to a console that drives it, and well, behold, you look at the monitor, and on the monitor there is what looks like a normal cardiac output with a normal pressure curve, and you don't need the heart-lung machine. Uh, I didn't have to regulate heart rate. Just ask him, I need, I appreciate if the heart rate is 75, they give me 75. The heart-lung bypass machine was discontinued. Carp's life was now sustained by the artificial heart. It was an exciting operation because it was the uh, first time it had ever been done. But we just went about it in a methodic way. Well, we were all happy that it worked and that uh, it appeared to be successful. Uh, I guess there's always that fear that it, that it wouldn't be successful, and uh, we didn't really know. Well, it was so uh, uh, really stimulating to see that this mechanical device was producing a pulse wave, which is absolutely normal, compatible with a normal heart and circulation. Uh, 
soon uh, thereafter, after we closed his incision and everything, he awakened, opened his eyes and so forth. And we were, you know, so pleased, uh, gratified uh, that perhaps the mechanical heart era had arrived. This whole thing was very humbly executed. I mean, the, the surgeons did their job, the researchers did their job. I didn't see any uh, excitement and loud and laughing or anything. I, what I saw was apprehension, concern. The scientific concentration was so high that I think there was no other time, time for other feelings. For the first time in history, a human being was being kept alive by a plastic heart. Almost immediately after the operation, a search was underway for a donor heart. Mrs. Carp would be among the first to bring the news of the historic operation to the world. I see him lying there, breathing, and knowing that within his chest is a man-made implement where there should be a God-given heart. How long can he survive? One can only guess. Now, there was little for Haskell Carp to do but wait. Uh, we tried not to disturb him very much. Uh, I assume he, uh, all the time that he was expecting or worried about a donor heart to replace the mechanical heart. Uh, I don't think he was heavily sedated, so they were able to communicate with him. His wife was able to communicate with him. Uh, we really tried not to disturb him very much because I knew that these things can be a lot of stress for the patient. Though he began to draw strength from the synthetic heart, Carp's condition remained critical. Long before this life-saving operation had taken place, his own failing heart had spawned a number of other health problems, including kidney failure and lung congestion. On the third day of Carp's vigil with the mechanical device, word arrived that a donor was available. The Leota Total Artificial Heart had kept Haskell Carp alive for 64 hours. As the donor heart was being harvested in an adjacent operating room, Dr. Cooley reopened Carp's chest for the transplant procedure. Again, Carp's circulation was assumed by the heart-lung bypass machine. The artificial heart was then deactivated. Grafts and suture lines were cut leaving adequate tissue for the attachment of the donor heart. Right and left halves of the cardiac prosthesis were removed. The donor heart was then brought to the table. Haskell Carp would become Cooley's 18th heart transplant patient. The donor left atrium was sutured to the remnants of Carp's left atrium, followed by the right atrial attachment. Carp's pulmonary artery was then sewn onto its appropriate outflow point on the donor heart. The final connection was made between Carp's aorta and the aortic remnant on the donor allograft. Defibrillating paddles were used to jolt the heart into a normal rhythm. I have remember the unusual severe excitement when you see a donor heart after it has been implanted just jump up like a bird out of a cage and fly. Oh, I was, I was really thrilled at that point because I felt sure that the man was going to survive and that we would have created a real uh, 
milestone in heart surgery. Though the surgical aspects of Mr. Karp's treatment were brought to a successful conclusion, there would be new challenges to overcome. What was very uh, stimulating and pleasing was that we managed to tide somebody over a very critical part with a mechanical heart till we found a donor heart. And the unfortunate situation in this case is uh, Mr. Haskell Karp developed uh, two complications unrelated to the heart. The decade-long degeneration of Karp's old heart had taken its toll on his overall health, creating obstacles to post-transplant recovery. This was further complicated by the fact that the very drugs used to fight organ rejection were weakening Karp's immune system. You know, we had had him on these anti-rejection drugs almost from the time we put in the mechanical device. And I think that by the time he uh, got the donor heart, his resistance had been reduced uh, substantially uh, by these uh, drugs. And so that he was very susceptible uh, to uh, infection at that time. The lung congestion that had been plaguing carp for some time would evolve into pneumonia. At the same time, efforts to reverse the course of kidney failure were ineffective. During the 32 hours that followed the transplant operation, the donor heart itself functioned well. But it would not be enough. At 10 minutes past 4 on the afternoon of April 8, 1969, Haskell Karp's battle for survival came to an end. And yet, this bitter outcome was not without its positive elements. Although Mr. Karp had failed to recover after the transplant, a major scientific victory had nonetheless occurred. It demonstrated uh, for the first time that human circulation could be sustained over a significant period of time with a totally uh, mechanical uh, device. Now, this uh, really uh, was the clinical test which was needed. We had, of course, at one time been ex very optimistic about our ability to bring him through, but uh, uh, like so many uh, heroic efforts, they don't all uh, give you 100% uh, success. Medical professionals and scientists worldwide began praising Denton Cooley and his surgical team for their valiant efforts to save Haskell Karp. Domingo Leota's device was lauded as a major breakthrough in the field of medical science. But in the midst of praises came voices of consternation from Baylor. Dr. DeBakey, unaware of Cooley's independently funded development and testing of the Leota heart, was concerned that an inferior Baylor prototype had been used in the CARP operation. Once the details of the case were fully revealed, Cooley was vindicated. But the news media would embellish upon the misunderstanding and perpetuate the Texas legend of an ongoing surgical rivalry. Thus, when Cooley's alma mater, the University of Texas, invited him to join the faculty of its Houston Medical Branch, Cooley found it easy to bid farewell to Baylor. Domingo Leota's affiliation with Baylor also ended. He eventually returned to his native Argentina and established a surgical practice of his own. The 1970s would usher in a new era for Denton Cooley and the Texas Heart Institute. The focus of clinical studies shifted toward partial artificial hearts which could be implanted in patients who suffered from failure of a single pumping chamber in the heart. Cooley's surgical team also carried out early human implants of a circulatory assist device that could be inserted into a patient's aorta by way of an artery in the leg. This intra-aortic balloon pump did just what its name implied. A balloon at the end of a narrow arterial catheter was rapidly inflated and deflated in the aorta. 
This action caused blood to be propelled through the arterial network. This short-term device was designed to temporarily reduce the workload of the heart, allowing recovery to take place after a severe heart attack has occurred or a difficult open heart operation has been performed. The intra-aortic balloon pump has gone on to save the lives of thousands and continues to be used today. But for patients with profound heart failure, devices capable of providing greater blood flow were needed. Thus, in the early 1970s, Cooley and his associates established a new surgical research program focusing on devices that could either augment, substitute, or replace the function of the compromised heart. A new building for the Texas Heart Institute was completed in 1971, and with a contribution from Houston's prominent Cullen family, the cardiovascular research laboratories were staffed and equipped. Under the direction of Dr. John Norman, the laboratories launched an aggressive mechanical heart program in the spring of 1972. Jack Fuquay has been there from the beginning. The uh, first device that we worked on was called the Thermoelectron Model 7 left ventricular assist device, and there were several related uh, projects to that. The device was implanted in the abdomen of the patient. It uh, had an inlet tube that penetrated the diaphragm and was connected to the heart. It took uh, blood from the left ventricle and then the outflow from the device was into the abdominal aorta. So blood came into the pump here. Uh, this bladder was compressed, pumping blood out uh, through this fitting into the aorta. The Thermoelectron Model 7 was the first government-sponsored totally implantable left ventricular assist device, a type of partial artificial heart. In December of 1975, Dr. Denton Cooley implanted the first of 25 Model 7 devices in humans with varying degrees of success. This was pretty early in the development and uh, the patients, in many cases, uh, we weren't allowed to to use the device until they were in very dire straits. We did have some recovery with the device and we were able to at least prove at that time, uh, some 20 years ago, that the concept was good, that you could rest the heart and that the heart muscle could recover. And that has led to a series of other devices that are now available today. As clinical studies with the Model 7 device were being carried out, Animal tests were underway with a nuclear-powered left ventricular assist device. In this short-term government-sponsored investigation, the level of heat dissipated by a plutonium power source was examined. Because of the overall unpopularity of nuclear power among the general public, alternative energy sources continued to be investigated. This study nevertheless marked the introduction of the pusher plate blood pump, a design that would play a significant role in the future of partial artificial heart technology. Meanwhile, development of the total artificial heart continued at the Texas Heart Institute. In 1974, Dr. Tetsuzo Akutsu became an associate director of the research laboratories. Akutsu, like Domingo Leota before him, had been a member of Willem Kolff's team at the Cleveland Clinic and had played a major role in the early canine artificial heart studies of the late 1950s. At the Heart Institute, Akutsu, aided by engineers and surgical research fellows, designed and refined his artificial heart through the remainder of the 1970s. Calf studies with his final design, the Akutsu 3, yielded the most promising results. Since donor organs remained in short supply, doctors would not have to look far to find a patient in dire need of the Akutsu 3. On July 20, 1981, 36-year-old Willa Broidus Moifels was flown in from the Netherlands for treatment at the Texas Heart Institute. 
Moifels, diagnosed with congestive heart failure and extensive coronary artery disease, was taken to the operating room on July 23rd for coronary artery bypass surgery. Muifel's heart was extremely weak, requiring assisted circulation from an intra-aortic balloon pump. While recovering in the intensive care unit that afternoon, his heart stopped. Measures were quickly taken to revive the heart, and Muifels was returned to the operating room where he was placed on the heart-lung bypass machine. Muifel's heart was found to be unsalvageable. Consent to use the Akutsu 3 total artificial heart was obtained from Muifel's wife. Muifel's heart was then removed. This artificial heart implant procedure would differ slightly from the Haskell carp operation of 1969. Instead of sewing the atrial tissue directly onto the fabric cuffs of the artificial heart, fitting rings were first sutured in. This allowed each half of the artificial heart to be quickly snapped into place. The design made it easy to switch out pumping chambers in the event of device failure. Each half of the artificial heart was a seamless unit containing two blood chambers, a pumping diaphragm, and prosthetic valves for inflow and outflow of blood. The Akutsu 3 device, like the Leota artificial heart, was powered by an external pneumatic drive console. For only the second time in history, a total artificial heart had been implanted in a human. The date was July 23, 1981, more than 12 years after the first implant had taken place. And once again, it was Denton Cooley who had performed the surgical feat. The Akutsu 3 total artificial heart sustained Willie Moifel's life for the entire 55 hours that it took to acquire a donor heart. Dr. Cooley carried out the transplant operation on July 25th. Organ rejection problems continued to plague the field of heart transplantation, but now word had come out that a promising new anti-rejection drug was forthcoming though still in the testing stages. In the meantime, it was hoped that Moifels would respond well to the current anti-rejection drug, Imuran, until the new drug, Cyclosporin, was given approval by the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. Assisting Dr. Cooley in the Moifels case was Dr. O.H. Frazier, who would later become director of the Cullen Cardiovascular Research Laboratories at the Heart Institute. Well, we only had Imuran and uh, steroids. That was before cyclosporin. And cyclosporin it allowed the patients to overcome infections more readily than the old immune suppression. It spares the non-specific -speci immune system, such as the white blood cells, still work. And I think that's its main virtue, whereas the other drugs are uh, a bone marrow suppressant that all the elements of the bone marrow are suppressed. <laughs> Moifels would go on to live for seven days with the donor heart beating in his chest. But with his immune system impaired by conventional anti-rejection drugs, infection spread through his bloodstream. He died on the 2nd of August, 1981. Had the operation occurred a year later, the most advanced anti-rejection drug would have been available to Mr. Muifels, and the outcome after transplantation might have been different. The heart itself was actually not rejecting, and it looked pretty good. We certainly still lose patients after a heart transplant, so I couldn't uh, say that he would have survived, but his, his statistically, I think his odds would have been a lot better. Though Willebroidus Moifels was unable to reap the benefits of cyclosporin therapy, 
His operation ushered in a second wave of clinical artificial heart research. Sixteen months after the Muevel's case, Barney Clark received the Jarvik 7 mechanical heart, a device nearly identical in design and function to the Akutsu 3 model. Instead of using the artificial heart as a bridge to heart transplantation, the University of Utah team implanted the Jarvik 7 as a permanent heart replacement. After 16 weeks on the device, Clark died. On November 25, 1984, nearly two years after Barney Clark's implant operation, the Jarvik 7 was once again used as a permanent heart replacement. William Schrader received the device at the Humana Heart Institute in Louisville, Kentucky. Though he would live for an astonishing 620 days with the device, he would suffer a series of strokes during the time of implant. This would raise concerns about the risk of clot formation on the internal blood contacting surfaces of mechanical hearts. For years, the aim of many medical scientists had been to develop blood contacting surfaces that would be too smooth to allow blood clot formation. Yet they were never quite able to achieve this goal. Researchers at the Texas Heart Institute took a different approach. Together with Massachusetts-based Thermocardio Systems, a spin-off of Thermoelectron, they developed a left ventricular assist device with internal surfaces that facilitated the buildup of a natural biological lining using the patient's own cellular components. This biological lining would resemble the inner wall of a blood vessel, providing a clot-resistant blood flow environment. On January 19, 1986, this left ventricular assist device, the Model 14, was implanted in the abdomen of a 47-year-old man whose own left ventricle had failed after two massive heart attacks. The device supported him for 41 days until a heart transplant could be carried out. It was a promising start for the Model 14. On February 3rd of 1986, only 15 days after this left ventricular assist device had been implanted, Doctors Denton Cooley and O.H. Frazier implanted a Jarvik 7 total artificial heart into the chest of 41-year-old Harris Kent. Unlike the previous teams that had used the Jarvik 7 as a permanent heart replacement, Cooley and Frazier elected to employ the device strictly as a temporary bridge to cardiac transplantation. Well, we never felt that device was suitable for a permanent pump. We felt it was a bridge pump. It was designed as a bridge technology uh, in Dr. Cooley's mind and certainly in our mind with the pneumatic drive line. It wasn't amenable to a, for a permanent pump. It was too cumbersome. But as a bridge to transplant, I think it, it ultimately worked very well. The implant procedure was almost identical to the case where the Akutsu 3 artificial heart had been used. Fitting rings were sutured to the atrial tissue, allowing the left and right halves of the mechanical heart to be snapped into place. Like the Leota and Akutsu 3 devices before it, the Jarvik 7 was driven by an external pneumatic drive console. Feeling it's kind of hard to describe. Mm -hmm. You see an artificial device, particularly one that's, that's transparent, where you can see the blood membranes moving and so forth, pumping blood that you know that is sustaining the life of a patient. Where just a few minutes earlier, that function had been performed by a uh, piece of defective muscle that's been removed. And uh, of course, it's even. Uh, a happier time when you see the patient wake up and recognize the surroundings and uh, begin to talk to you and so on. The Jarvik 7 kept Harris Kent alive for 31 days. He received a donor heart on the 7th of March. Unlike Haskell Karp and Willa Broidus Muifels before him, 
Harris Kent would be treated with the highly advanced anti-rejection drug cyclosporin. While the immune system normally regarded donor organs as outside invaders, cyclosporin had the unique ability to selectively inhibit this response without drastically impairing the immune system's infection-fighting mechanisms. After the heart transplant, Harris Kent would begin the gradual recovery process. His subsequent release from the hospital was seen as a significant step forward for the artificial heart program at the Texas Heart Institute. In 1988, Dr. O.H. Frazier began to reevaluate the timing strategies of mechanical heart implantation. Up until that time, artificial hearts and heart assist devices were implanted only when patients were at the brink of death. But in the final stages of heart failure, other organs would likewise begin to fail, making recovery difficult even after circulation was restored by either a mechanical heart device or a donor heart. Thus, on the 10th of March, 1988, when Dr. Frazier implanted a thermocardio systems Model 14 left ventricular assist device in the abdomen of 48-year-old Ken Bradley, he did not wait until the final hours of life to perform the operation. Within days, Bradley was out of bed and walking. During the 37 days on the device, his condition improved rapidly, and by the time a donor heart became available, he was healthier than most transplant candidates. Bradley made a quick recovery after transplantation and was released from the hospital in full health. When 22-year-old Michael Doss received his left ventricular assist device on August 2nd, 1988, his recovery was even faster. He was able, within two weeks of the implant of the pump, to get up, uh, switch the pump over to the battery uh, function, go out and help the nurses with their morning chores and errands, uh, and was a self-care patient. This Model 14 thermocardio systems device was given the new name HeartMate. Its sole function was to assume the duties of the heart's most essential blood pumping chamber. Because the patient's own heart remained in the chest cavity, the HeartMate was placed in the upper left abdomen. Michael Doss waited 35 days for a donor heart. When it came, he was in excellent physical condition. Months later, he would describe his experiences with the HeartMate device. Like two days, you know, I was back up, sitting up. You know, of course, I was sore from the surgery, but this LVAD, it took the place of my left heart, I guess, and it made my kidneys, my liver. I was using the bathroom. I was sleeping flat on my back. I had no fluid build up. I, I, I could, you know, I was warm again. It just took the place of my heart, and I felt great. Throughout the remainder of the 1980s and into the 90s, more and more patients with terminal heart disease were able to buy crucial waiting time while improving their physical conditions thanks to the HeartMate left ventricular assist device. Case after case went by without an incident of clot-related stroke. Well, Vic Poirier was the chief engineer on that project. And I think he, uh, he deserves the, the, the bulk of the engineering credit, although like most projects, there were a lot of people that had some uh, uh, input on it. The HeartMate experience at the Texas Heart Institute would go on to become the most successful clinical research trial in the history of mechanical heart technology. Advancements with other circulatory assist devices would be made at the Institute during this period. On April 25th of 1988, Dr. Frazier, along with cardiologist Dr. Wayne Deere, implanted the world's smallest circulatory assist pump in a human. The hemopump, which employed a blood propulsion system the size of a pencil eraser, was the brainchild of Dr. Richard Wampler. The, the hemopump is a, a special kind of assist device because it can be used without major surgery. 
And this uh, very miniaturized pump is small enough that it can be placed up an artery and then into the heart uh, to provide a, a boost or assist for the heart. Well, of course, the Jarvie card or the thermal cardio systems pump, um, uh, any variety of the, the larger mechanical or, or pulse assist devices really are intended for longer term use in the hemo pump. But really, most patients just require acute assistance. So potentially, uh, people with acute heart attacks or people that don't come off the bypass machine, those are people that could be benefited by the hemo pump technology. This first patient and many others recovered thanks to the hemo pump. It is believed that this device will one day replace the intra-aortic balloon pump. The decade of the 1990s began with another first for the Texas Heart Institute surgical research program. It involved the implantation of a new type of HeartMate ventricular assist device. This HeartMate was driven by an internal electric motor, eliminating the need for an external drive console. Clinical trials began in May of 1991. One of the earliest and most celebrated recipients of the electrical HeartMate was 33-year-old Michael Templeton. His pump was powered by two batteries worn in a shoulder holster, making mobility virtually unlimited. Mike almost became a part of the hospital. He was all over the, the hospital. He worked down here in our lab working with computers while he was still uh, being supported by the device. And of course, we really got to know him that way. But no clinical research trial is immune from setbacks, especially during its early phase. After 16 months on the battery-powered HeartMate, Michael Templeton was felled by a fatal stroke. Though suspicions naturally turned toward the device as the source of embolus, its interior surfaces were found to be clean with no indication of clot formation. In the end, it was believed that Templeton's own deteriorating heart provided the environment for clot formation. Drug regimens of subsequent HeartMate recipients were adjusted to anticipate this potential long-term complication, and the HeartMate pump would go on to prove itself as being the safest, most effective bridge to heart transplantation of its time. Within the confines of the Cullen Cardiovascular Surgical Research Laboratories of the Texas Heart Institute, investigators are at work today on new devices that will aid cardiac patients in the new millennium. Dr. Robert Jarvik is developing a new type of ventricular assist pump that is small enough to implant in children for long durations. At the present time, there are no such implantable heart assist devices for children. Research continues in the pursuit of the ultimate permanent total artificial heart, one that will put an end to the donor shortage problem once and for all. In 1988, the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute awarded the Texas Heart Institute and Abiomed Incorporated of Danvers, Massachusetts, a contract to develop a permanent, wholly implantable, electrohydraulic total artificial heart. Animal tests with the THI Abiomed device have yielded promising preliminary results. The biggest characteristic is long-term reliability. You know, the heart pumps 100,000 times a day. So it's, uh, it's not the pumping per se, it's the longevity of the pumping and the reliability because it can't not pump for a minute or two minutes and the patient will die. To be feasible and successful, I think the device needs to be developed to the point where it, and I'm using the words of Dr. Rob Jarvik, where the device is forgettable. The patient has to be able to forget and the people that are important to that patient need to be able to forget that this patient even has an artificial heart. In addition to the THI Abiomed artificial heart studies, animal trials have been conducted for a total artificial heart designed by surgeon Didier Lepere for the French firm Aerospecial. 
time will tell if either of these, or perhaps another device, will become the ultimate man-made heart. Uh, we, we can do this. It's a, it's, it's a formidable engineering feat, but it can be done. It's a matter really of not of the technology or the know-how, it's a matter of how much money that uh, we want to spend. The interest has waxed and waned in the development of the total artificial heart, but I think that we must continue our interest in this field and hope that uh, it can be supported uh, on a research level and an investigative level, and I think that if we continue, that ultimately we'll have something of practical value. Uh, the past 25 years have seen a regrowth of cardiac transplantation, uh, so that there have been some 20,000 done throughout the world, uh, but at the same time, uh, that's not adequate to, to carry us uh, into uh, the next century. I believe in a great country where we can put people on the moon and we can put people in space. We can do the same thing. We have the ability and the technology and the know-how to do this, but we have never had the funding levels that are necessary to accomplish this goal in a timely manner. And until it becomes a priority, uh, it will probably continue to be another 10 years and yet another 10 years and we still won't have the artificial heart.